and welcome to Youth and Sports, where every Tuesday night at 7.30 p.m. we feature special guests from near and far. The program is sponsored by ATI Physical Therapy, providing certified athletic trainers to more than 30 area high schools and colleges. First State Orthopedics, the team taking care of Delaware with a commitment to excellence. And Wilmington University, where Youth and Sports is produced by the College of Technology's students and faculty. And now, from the studio at President Jack Barcelona's Wilmington University, your hosts for Youth and Sports, ALSSM Mr. Sports Medicine 2012, Dr. Michael Axe, UD and St. Elizabeth's own Dr. Joseph Strait, and co-founder of Youth and Sports, Mr. Walter Laudin. Hey, Dr. Michael Axe, welcome to Youth and Sports. We have a great show tonight. On my right is Dr. Joe Strait, again uh, with WorkPro and First Day Orthopedics, and we have the pleasure of introducing our new partner. This is his showcase. Dr. James Zaslavsky, it's spelled Z-A-S-L-A-V-S-K-Y. We're going to call him Dr. Z, like you know Dr. Oz, <laughs> another local Wilmingtonian. Well, this is Dr. Z, and he's a spine surgeon, and he'll be joining us as of February 1st, 2013. But we thought it'd be nice for you to get a feel for what he does, where he came from, his background, as we showcased all our young partners that they've joined. We did a special show on uh, Dr. Strait and his St. E's era. Uh, and we're going to do that today <laughs> with uh, with Dr. Z. Hey, Jim, thanks for coming down. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we Dr. want Rath, to Street, thank you. For yeah, we me. want to make sure that everybody understands that when you join First State, it's because we're trying to to bring new stuff and uh, new people to an environment that allows them to to show off their wares and. Gosh, we don't know where to start with you. Why don't you just, uh, <laughs> he has a lot to show off, as you'll be able to tell over the course of the evening. Uh, you started, uh, give a little bit of your background. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Bucks County. You know, my early childhood was in uh, Philadelphia, and uh, my parents had moved up to Bucks County, and uh, when we got there, I, I thought we were going to become farmers or something. It was farmlands and open area, uh, and coming from the city, it was a big change. But so you it, came from the city of Philly? Mm -hmm. Came from the city of Philly. Uh, but it was a great childhood. Uh, I grew up a very active lifestyle. Tons of Where'd farms. you go to high school? Council Rock High School. Okay, so uh, you guys, oh, Council right. Rock will be very down nice at the Beast school. of the East. They're a mm -hmm. heck of a football team. Uh, great Impressive. school. Was there about 2,000 kids in your class? There was about, uh, there was almost 2,000 kids in our graduating class. And since that time, they He was split. first, by the way. I want you to know that. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> what they, were you? Well yeah. up there. I know all the medical yeah. guys were. Yeah. How many beat kids? Me. How many? Yeah, me too. <laughs> How many people in your high school class that graduated? How many were in your graduating class? My graduating class was over a little over a thousand. Okay. How so many and then they doctors? split. There they we split go. Into you know? two uh, high schools since then. How many? Do you know how many became physicians? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, probably. You're just glad any you, that did. you know of? Yeah, I was, glad, I was glad to be in the group that they did. Yeah, I'm sure there's a were couple others. Were you active others. in sports? Council I was. I was. I, I played football, Council Rock, and uh, you know I was also active on, in other what areas. What position? I played wide receiver and cornerback while I was there. Right. Fellow defensive so, back, we like that. Well, I we, that. we didn't throw the ball much, so there, there was a lot of, it was more defensive <laughs> Know about that. Yeah. How many kids right. were on your varsity football team? Oh, God. A lot. A lot. You know, yeah. when you go to a big school, I went to a high school that had 2,000 for three grades, which is about equivalent to what, to what although... Your graduating class of 1,000 is huge. Huge, yeah. They, you must have had 4,000 kids in the class. It was bigger than the college I went to. So, oh. yeah. About the size of William Penn? Yeah. No, it's much bigger. William bigger. Penn is 1,700 to 2,000, wow. and they're four grades. Because I know my, my graduating thousand. class was 104. Well, yeah. my, my, my class is a sophomore. We, went, uh, we had junior high and high school. But my class is a sophomore. We had 741. Mm. 741. Now, that's impressive. The only reason I remember that is because after one year, I was 13th. I, I dwindled thereafter. But, you know, I just remember that. But you had 1,000 who graduated. Well, we only graduated 565, and we had a lot of attrition. Yeah. I don't think we have enough televisions in Lancaster. But a lot of the people kind of <laughs> fell by the wayside. And how many started with you in your freshman class? Do you have any idea? Uh, no idea. And graduation was three hours long. They graduated 1,000 yeah. people. We were, we were there most of the night. <laughs> wow. But uh, thousand it, people. Thousand people. It was like two and so a half you, times it, my school. Well, you, yeah, it was. Yeah, it absolutely. Class. Wow. I I got that. Yeah, big so school. They that, split since that time into two high schools because uh -huh. it just got. It and what is the Council Rock East and West? Uh, north and South now. North and South. Mm -hmm. Where Where'd you go after high school? Uh, after high school, I went to Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science. It's now called the University of the Sciences in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. 
and I went into physical therapy. Uh, I, I as kinda, an undergrad? As an undergrad, yeah. Four-year program? It's a five-year program straight through. You get And you got a master's. You get a master's degree afterwards. And uh, I wanted to go into marine biology, but my mom said, look, get the paper and see if you can find any marine biology jobs. Well, no, no, yeah. it's a great story. You know, I was being recruited. In, I was recruited in high school, and one of my outs was I told them I wanted to be a marine biologist because that eliminated about half the schools that were bothering me about coming to go to their school. And I said, oh, no, no. They said, oh, really? We have that program? So you went to the program, okay? Went, yeah, yeah, University And then of things got exciting, right? So yeah. you, you graduated. You're a previous athlete. Did you play any sports at the College of Science? I, I did intramural sports, you know, in terms of basketball. We, we had a softball team and a basketball team, you know, in terms of athletics. And you were the sports. center? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, we played on the, I played in the fraternity intramural league. That's, sure, that's right? a perfect team to play on. Right. Uh, or, when you got out of PT school, where'd you end up going? Uh, yeah, I, I was living in Philly at the time, and I had found a job in uh, Bal Kinwood at, a no, at NovaCare, which was a uh, Pat Croce center that he had just sold at the time to NovaCare. And uh, lucky enough, that was the center that treated the Sixers, so it, it got kind of exciting where I was so able to work with them. Tell us a story. Yeah, you got to tell some kind of story. Right tell us away. a story. There's got to be uh, someone that came in that was first memorable. Story, their first story as at NovaCare, and a Sixer comes in, and obviously the table wasn't long enough. <laughs> well, actually, I was uh, doing office hours with uh, Jack McPhillamy, who was the Sixers doctor and still is the Sixers doctor. And I remember that uh, this tall kid comes in and he's you know young kid but I can't just believe how tall he is and he's got a gash on his head and Jack says hey do me a favor grab this gauze you know grab some gloves hold this pressure on his head so I'm holding pressure on his head and in walks Dikembe Mutombo so apparently his kid was just injured in a you know in a game at school and I cannot believe the size of Dikembe Mutombo let alone his 12 year old son who was about at least a foot taller than myself at the time <laughs> so here I am two hands up in the air holding some gauze <laughs> You know, on, on Dikembe's son, but and wound up, you know, with, stitching him up that day with Dr. McPhillamy. I, I have to tell a great story because uh, Pitt at the, was the era when Georgetown had all their, both Patrick Ewing and so forth, and the Villanova teams of the great ones. And they would come into Pitt, and we had a similar, similar incident, only one of the, the, it was one of the Georgetown's athletes, they had had sore throats. And you can just imagine they were so much taller than I. I was trying to look in their throats, Doctor Straight, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it with them sitting. So it w I was so flummoxed by the whole thing. I stood on a chair to look on their throat, and that dawned on me. All I had to do was put them on their back, and I could have looked right, you know, looked down. But uh, I understand the circumstances you're taking when you yeah. normally do things a certain way. Yeah. It was like, come you do a lot, on, you do a lot of standing on chairs. It's oh. funny how you remember all those things, especially with sport athletes or. You know the the children sure. of sport athletes because I remember mine was well, I was actually working at, we'll get into a little bit more of, of where he went after this but I was working with Mike Sacati at Rothman sure. and uh, Scott Rowland came in after a hand injury. Now Doctor Z makes Mike Sacati. Uh, Doctor Z is a giant compared <laughs> to Mike Sacati. Just say, Mike wrestled one thirteen I think at Wilkes or one of the other schools up in uh, in Penn Scranton maybe he was at Scranton but he definitely was a wrestler at the lightest weight class which is one twenty three at the time. So, but it, it's just funny how you can remember all those things and how enjoyable and it, the laughs you get from them. So, yeah. how long were you a therapist? I was a therapist for three years. And uh, okay, so you work with Dr. McPhillamy, mm -hmm. and uh, who is the team physician for the Seventy Sixers. Also, he's one of the the musculoskeletal faculty for PCOM, which is Pennsylvania College of Osteopathic Medicine, which is one of the five medical schools in Philadelphia. And we'll talk a little bit about the difference between osteopathic medicine and traditional uh, uh, medicine in a, one of our future segments uh, here uh, tonight. But uh, you were doing that for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and you developed this relationship with Dr. McPhillamy. Tell us how your relationship with the Sixers blossomed. So you were on Ballot Kinwood then, but did you then start going down to the to the sites, or how did it work? Well, uh, being a physical therapist at the Bal Kinwood office, uh, you know, I immediately got interested and wanted to work with, with the team. You know, we saw them coming in at times to get treatment. And so I was Dr. McPhillamy's physical therapist that would go to the office, 
meet him when he was evaluating a patient, get the plan for the patient. It's a very technically specific plan. Every day counts. Every practice missed is time lost. Every game that you, you know you miss is, is, is extremely valuable. So, so you're right now you're I would training implement your brain. The plan. Now you're training your brain for the rest of your life that time matters. Right. Uh, and, and one of the things with Dr. Strait and I, we know that if you miss one week, you'll miss 10% of your season. Right. If mm -hmm. you miss two weeks, you're missing 20%. Now, that's not the NBA season. Obviously, they go from September to June. So it's a lot longer for a season for them. So they have, But they play 80 games, and we're used to playing a lot less than that. So, But you're training your brain. And one of the things about being a sports therapist, which you were at the time, mm -hmm. and then the transition to being a spine therapist, which is a little bit on the other end, and I'll, I'll have fun talking with you about how you had to tr change your brain that... that days became weeks and weeks became months based upon the months. biology it is the body needs to have time to heal and bone needs to have a little bit less time to be solid than soft tissues do but yet most of your problems in spine injuries are soft tissue with a little bit of bone if it's not a car accident or the like and I'll, I'll, I'll be interested to hear how you changed your mindset going from something that was short-lived, so something that, that took a lot longer. Well, let's go back to this. So you worked with Dr. McPhillamy for three years. Now, as yep. the story goes, because I, you, you've shared this with me off camera, that uh, he starts talking to you. When in those three years does he start saying, you know, maybe you want to go to med school? Well, I, I think he, he realized I had a, a keen interest for surgery and the technical ability to, to fix things <laughs> in the operating room. You know, I would spend my lunch hours, you know, going to watch him operate if he had some, like, a fracture to fix or if he was operating on, you know, doing some knee scopes. So I spent a lot of time kind of hanging around on my own free time, and he realized that, you know, I'm, I'm going to need more of a, you know, a challenge and more of a technical involvement, you know, in my career. So uh, he, he, you know, and as well as myself, I expressed an interest in, in one day doing, you know, what he does, and, and he said, well, I can open that avenue up for you. Just now, you know. where are we now? Are we this is about my, my second year as a therapist. Second year know. as a therapist. And were you thinking about doing orthopedic sports at that I, time? I was thinking, yeah, I was, I was definitely thinking I would like to do something orthopedics, and I realized I want to use more of my technical skills. Yeah, as, a, as a kid, my, my, you know, as a young kid, my dad had constantly promoted technical ability and uh, taught me how to use tools on a regular basis. And, uh, what did he, he do for a living? He was an electrical engineer, but every weekend was a new project at home. So he constantly made me figure out what the game plan is for putting in some cabinets and come up with a, you know, a, a, an idea of the time frame it's going to take. And we finished. Are you the oldest or the youngest? Uh, I'm the youngest. Okay. How many, how and many I was his, you know, I, I couldn't wait for the weekend to come around and be <laughs> his little right hand man, and, and, you know, and help him get through the project. And, uh, you know, I, I developed a keen interest for using tools and, and for, you know, developing technical skills. I, I think I brought a nail gun into school when I was six for show and tell. And I had uh, people taking duck and, duck and cover that day. They were a think, little surprised. That, that's when you know that. Yeah. That's a good so everybody's like, he's, he's got a real... When, when your father's he's not six. an electrician. He didn't say he was an electrician. <laughs> that, that, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's My daughter any, brings in Kit Kats. Yeah. 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 Bringing in a nail so gun. So show and tell is <laughs> a nail gun. Yeah. Sure. This yeah. is like, what is that? <laughs> this, is, uh, we got, this is the intro to doctors. This last week will be back right after this on Youth in Sports. I will keep dancing on point, even if it hurts. Ah, my arm is killing me. I don't know if I can pitch another ball. But I'll just play through the pain anyway. I have to do the big stunts. They look better than the other cheerleaders. Their tosses are bigger. My elbow really aches, but I've got to be better. Don't tell them it hurts. It'll take you out of the game if you do. I have to push harder if I'm going to get a scholarship. I'm feeling dizzy, but I don't want to tell anyone. Everyone's counting on me. I can't rest now. Nearly 50% of all sports injuries sustained by middle and high school students are from overuse. Don't play through the pain. See your health care provider and follow their instructions for rest and recovery. Take the pledge. Become an advocate for sports safety. Visit stopsportsinjuries.org.
Welcome back to segment two of Youth in Sports. This is the opening uh, round for Dr. Zaslavsky <laughs> as he joins First Aid Orthopedics as a spine surgeon uh, here with uh, one of our many uh, folks at First Aid Orthopedics, and we're glad he's our new addition. He'll be joining us February 1st on 2013. So those of you who are viewing this show prior to that, he's coming after that, he's here. Uh, Dr. Strait, what's your question you have for Dr. Z? Well, we, we were starting, we ended the last segment with talking about how you were getting into uh, medical school. So when did you finally decide it? Yeah, it was probably my second year in physical therapy where I realized that, you know, I want to do more with my hands and I want to, you know, I want to, I, I kind of watched Dr. McPhillamy operating at my lunch hours and I'm thinking, this is what me and my dad used to do, you know, on, on weekends. This Except was, it didn't bleed and it didn't get infected. Yeah, and then there was fancy suits and <laughs> yeah. there was expensive equipment. I said, look at all these toys. So, you know, it, it, it was extremely appealing to me. And I really what did your mom think when she bought, you know, your dad bought her a, a new wash machine or something? <laughs> <laughs> that was always a shock to her. I think she got used to it after a while. <laughs> well, I want to know, the biggest thing it always is, when you're already out in the workplace and making money and in a career, and then you have to stop making money and head to medical school. Yeah, that, that was difficult. I was, you know, going back to eating ramen noodles for dinner, and you know, you, you, you kind of miss out on that lifestyle. You had a great job, you had great hours, and all of a sudden you're what were you you're driving day and night? I think you know, when I was a physical therapist, I was driving a Jeep Wrangler. And, uh, That's appropriate for a young man, yeah. age 22, 23 at the time, right? Yeah, my, my only although concern, not safe in Philly. Yeah, not with, a, not, with a, not with a rag top. Right. The key was don't leave anything in there that could be removed, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> including seats, because they like seats too. But overall, um, you know, I was lucky my Jeep Wrangler hung in, hung in there through five years of med school. So where would you end up going? I went to PCOM, school. to where Dr. McPhillamy is alma mater. And I was kind of encouraged by the way he took care of patients. He, you know, loved to operate. You know, he was technically great at doing it. But uh, he, he loved the patient, too, and uh, he took care of the patient in all aspects of care. So he really he cared about his biggest concern was, is his patient going to get back to function? Is he going to do what he wants to do? Well, you went from PCOM, and I'm going to go back and forth in this segment, because I think it's important because we have uh, several osteopathic physicians that are part of our practice, and we, we welcome that addition. So you went to Thomas Jefferson, which is a holopathic uh, program uh, at... Uh, for residency, but yet you did your training at PCOM. Mm -hmm. Now, to accomplish that, uh, to go from PCOM to Jefferson, is a real tribute to Dr. Z. That that is not an easy undertaking. It, to have those credentials, to be able to make that jump, uh, particularly from the Jeffersonian attitude and what he was bringing to the table, uh, I take my hat off to you. You certainly got my attention that you were able to acquire that kind of, of residency. That's a big deal. But let's just talk about, you took care of medical students on your service when you were there as a resident, and then what you were trained. How would you characterize the difference between the education between the two disciplines? Yeah, I think in, in so many ways they're extremely similar. Uh, and it, it 95%, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 That's comes, my interpretation. it comes down to the student and what he wants to get out of the education. Overall, I think that osteopathic schools uh, focus a little bit more on hands-on treatment. You learn, you know, more about the soft tissues of the body and manipulating I them. Totally with your agree hands. with you. I, that and better be for a therapist. Yeah, and, that, and how about that's what the, attracted how, me? Wait, wait, wait. How about coming from being a therapist to going to that environment? Yeah, that was Did, right, you, right up my alley. Had you learned any bad habits that you had to undo? You know, I don't know if I. It was more of an expansion of what I did as a therapist you know, the, into, into the osteopathic stuff. And, uh, you know, it was more of taking it a step further. I, don't, I can't remember any bad habits, you know. No, I, I wouldn't, I was just being a little bit fun with I it. I talked yeah. to some of my sports medicine colleagues that are primary care sports, and a lot of them are DOs. And yeah. I think that, that it's a real good setup for primary care musculoskeletal stuff, for orthopedics, because of mm -hmm. all the hands-on musculoskeletal medicine that they teach in DO versus allopathic medicine. Right. I think that the, all, the allopathic students that I got to work with all have a different facet to their education, and I think they're very yeah, research-driven. They're, they're well, they're research-driven and they're lab-driven. Right. And I think yep. that many times our interpretation of a puzzle uh, began more with a lab value than it did with putting the hands on the patient. And I, I really, from the allopathic standpoint, it's hard to get it all done. Mm -hmm. In a, I, I think that osteopathic physicians are much better prepared 
to go to an environment that doesn't have as much technology, Dr. Strait, where they can totally agree. and make their decisions based upon the few things they can carry in their white coat or not so white coat. Well, diagnosis right? is based more on exam findings versus diagnostic studies. Sure. Did you, did you find that your musculoskeletal, I mean, if, if you had to have a hybrid, it was uh, uh, going to uh, college at the College of the Sciences and becoming a physical therapist is about as ideal an environment that you could get for going on to becoming an orthopedic surgeon. I mean, I could... Especially I could, with all the added training you had at home. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> First of all, have you cut off any fingers yet? No, I haven't. How about your mom my, or dad? My, my shop teacher had two fingers uh, on his one hand in high school, and I learned from him very quickly to watch the safety on the power saw and be very careful. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we, everybody still has their fingers, and, and we're very, you know, that safety was always first <laughs> with, with that uh, lesson. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I agree that the, the osteopathic training in combination with physical therapy was a great setup for orthopedics. I, it was, I'm, uh, I'm totally respectful I, of that particular aspect of the discipline. Yeah. So you then went to medical school, okay? Now, did you go cold turkey because, you know, the first two years are both mostly basic science, although the PCOM, they do get you involved in the clinics a little bit more quickly than they do in the allopathic mm -hmm. aspect of things. So how did you stay involved with Dr. McPhillamy while you were still going to med school? Well, luckily, his office was right across the street. So, you know, times when I, you know, finished classes early, he was very flexible with me, come over whenever you want, put in a couple hours. I got to stay that's involved with, you know, caring for him, taking care of the six years still treating some patients over at the office, doing some physical therapy work. It was a good way to make some money, and it was a good way to, to, to keep my hands in the game in terms that's, of That's great. So when do you start having your clinical rotations? Third year? Your third year. And then obviously your life was not your own. Right. Yeah, that's when things get interesting. It's and not just a scheduled class, you know, that, that you know you, it's going to end at noon. It's uh, your right, own But call. then fourth year you got your life back. Because everyone's fourth year, it's the best year. Yeah. If I had to take <laughs> the best year in the last 35 years, it was my fourth year in medical school. You know, because of the fact that that you were still paying this ungodly amount of money to have fun. That's the only but bad your part. Life, about it. Yeah, that was the bad part. <laughs> the bad part. But the rest of it, it was yeah. just you got to take the rotations. So, what right. were your electives in your fourth year? So. This is when things didn't turn out great for me in terms of like having a really cushy fourth year, because I decided I was going to go to the University of Pen to, to, to the University of Pennsylvania Hospital, and I wanted to work with some of the big names in the city because I was getting ready to start, you know, getting ready to go in the residency, and I'm like, I want to see some of the big name stuff that's going on, and I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Booth and Dr. Balderson over there, as well as some of the other guys. Now, Dr. Booth is a total joint surgeon who did my mother, and. Uh, Dr. Balderson is uh, one of the three B's with Dr. Bartolosi, and Dr. Balderson is a spine surgeon. So I did not know this aspect, so I don't know where we're going, but go ahead. And uh, so, you know, after having worked with them for, for a month and I'm, you know, working extra hard, I'm really getting to do a lot and I'm seeing a lot of new things that I haven't been exposed to yet on, on my osteopathic rotations. They said, you know, you should really get over to Jefferson and talk to the residency guys over there and see if they have any openings, you know, if, if they'd have any interest, because you're really like the kind of person who would blossom over there, who'd really thrive. So then I'm thinking I'm going to have a cush rotation there, and then the next rotation turns into my Jefferson <laughs> residency <laughs> rotation. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working these crazy hours again. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Jefferson, wait, wait, That's Jefferson residents show up at 4 in the morning to get ready for rounds yeah. for the big dogs at 5.15. But they still, they make the 80-hour work week. Yeah, they do. Right. Yeah, they they do. That means That's in three days. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they make it. That means med, med students who want residency spots show up at 3. 3. That's, so, exactly, that's exactly what time showed up. That was a, that was a typical up. day, kind of waking up in the middle of the night, you know, heading over to the hospital. And I was having a great experience, and I was actually really enjoying myself. And, you know, you get to exposed to these people that write the books you read all of a sudden, and it was just a whole new world. I'm guessing it's cutting it was edge. Vic, Dr. Vaccaro. Dr. Vaccaro. Was Dr. it Hillebrand Albert, at the time? And, Hillebrand. And Todd Ellibar. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Great, Anderson. Great group. Great group of spying guys and great group of guys, you know, overall. Oh, yep. And uh, cutting edge, you know, very open-minded to new treatments, minimally invasive, you know, tools, things that you don't always see in smaller hospitals and community centers. So it was an incredible experience. And at the end of the rotation, I'm thinking, well, maybe I'll, I'll do an internship at my allopathic internship 
and uh, you know, come back and apply for a residency here. And these guys kind of dropped the bomb on me that they've got another spot and they'd like me to apply, you know, and, and um, I'm that's thinking, excellent. This is like great that's a timing. Great way. So, you know, I put an so application you're December, in. December, what time of the year is it? It's, it, we're in May, and I'm supposed to start my allopathic internship in Harrisburg July. in July. So it's May, and I'm putting in an application for an internship that starts in two months. And I'm thinking, uh, how is this going to work? But I'm not really worried about how it's going to work. I'm lucky enough these guys want me to apply to it. And in the application process, the woman who runs the application process is like, we don't have any DOs who apply here. I don't even know what these test scores mean that you have or what the, <laughs> your grades mean. She's like, I don't know how to interpret And I get this feeling like, you know, maybe this is just a courtesy thing because I'm working my tail off now and, and uh, you know, really enjoying, you know, what I'm doing. And they, you they were working that hard in May? Yeah, they, which was, which was the sad thing. <laughs> That rotation is, is very I should have been in Paradise for, City. All my friends are taking you know, four-week vacations and everything else. Oh, and, yeah. and, I, and I was waking up at 3 a.m. to go in and, and, and round on joint patients. So I put in the application, you know, and, and you know, the, we, ha we have our interview, and you know, it's uh, 30 guys who come in and interview them for, for one spot that they have. And you know, the interview process goes, goes pretty good, and, and uh, you know, we get ready to leave. And, uh, I, you know, get in the car and the interview uh, director says, you know, I'll give you guys a call sometime this weekend, let you know one way or another. So I get in the car and, you know, my phone starts ringing as, I'm, as I get on to Route 95. And uh, it's a number I don't recognize, but it looks like it's coming from the hospital. So, you know, I answer the phone and it's Dr. Sharkey. Oh, Dr. Sharkey, you know, hi, it's Jim. He's like, hey, you guys interviewed today. You were talking to that guy, Tom. Do you have his phone number? Because we want to give him the spot, but he didn't put his number on his application. So I'm thinking, oh my God. He's busting your chop. Yeah, but I have no idea because I'm taking it so seriously. <laughs> this is like my life. I, I, I would have known that. I would have known that. I would have story. I can't that believe guy. he's calling me, asking me for one of the other he applicants' phone number. numbers, you know, because he saw me talking to him and he wants to give him the spot. So I was like, I don't have it, Dr. Sharkey, but I'm sure you can call his program on Monday. He goes, ah, the heck with that. Why don't you just take the spot? We want to offer it to you. <laughs> And I hear the whole room just start laughing. Oh, I'm sure I can't you did. talk. I had to pull it over because oh, I didn't even think I could drive I, I at that point. I do understand. I do understand. Probably, probably one of the most exciting times in my life because you know I realize I'm going to have an opportunity to work with you know the guys that you know I could only dream of reading their books at one day. You know. All right. So be. we're going to paraphrase this in the last five seconds before we go to break. Uh, we're with Dr. Z, our newest member of the First Day Orthopedics crew. He'll be back right after this. What does opportunity mean to you? At Wilmington University, it means providing a personalized educational experience where students learn anywhere at any time. Wilmington University provides a variety of ways to complete your degree. Choose the flexibility of online learning or attend classes during the day, in the evening, or on weekends at locations throughout the region. It's your degree. Choose how you earn it. Personalized education, affordable tuition. That's the difference at Wilmington University. opportunity mean to you? At Wilmington University, it means finding an innovative degree program that fits your goals and prepares you for a successful career. It means finding a school that fits your life. We know the importance of providing individual attention, affordable tuition, and unparalleled flexibility and service. Because at Wilmington University, it's not about meeting your expectations, it's about exceeding them. Personalized education, affordable tuition, that's the difference at Wilmington University. Hey, we're back with Youth in Sports. I'm Dr. Strait, and we're here with Dr. Z. Um, we, we were just talking about his... Uh, Trials and tribulations. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's actually a great story. Oh, it is how a great he became story. a resident at Jefferson uh, for uh, orthopedics, and I want to go a little further into that. Please. Tell me about... I mean, we talked about how tough it was just as a rotation as a fourth-year student, but how tough was it your first couple years, and 
the residency there. It was it was incredibly hard. Uh, we didn't have when I started the first two years. We didn't have the 80-hour work we get, and uh, we were clocking into 126 and 130 hours a week. And uh, you know everybody complains about that, and uh, as well as did I. But I feel like I really had a deeper appreciation for what I was doing. I kind of knew what, like what it took. I did to my get internship. There. With, I internship with Jeff. Yeah, and and I, I, you know, I hated some of it. You know, and it was it was hard being in the hospital that that many hours a week. But I really couldn't I, believe where I was. It I was, still, I'm still it was a believer. Dream I know the 80 hours is is what's been set, but I still believe that you just get much more hands on and a better education with the more hours now. I believe that it challenges you. First of all, you thought you were making decisions. There's such a layer of decision making that the nurse would never <laughs> let you do something wrong anyway. <laughs> she asks you what you want to order just to make sure you're in agreement. Right. But she's going to work. She, she, she was going to order, order, order anyway. And if you didn't want to order that, she would let you know that. Don't you want to order yep. so and so? Like, so that that's number one. Uh, that uh, I agree with that. You one. know. So, but you think you're making a lot of decisions. What you're there to do is basically to write notes and make sure that the layers above you have all the information they need to be able to make critical decisions about can you go to the operating room and can you go home? I think those are the two two biggies. When you say well, that's the operating room is the hardest part. Being there tired is is a big thing, but I'll tell you, you guys are in the operating room a ton at Jefferson. Yeah. I mean, even in your second year I think it starts correct most yeah and, and most programs have a problem that there isn't enough cases for the residents to do or there isn't enough you know they're, they're, they're having two or three residents scrub that was never the case at Jefferson it was always a shortage of residents you know and, and it was always the, the running joke was yeah you can scrub and if your sister wants to come in today and scrub too we'll, we'll put her in a room as well they always needed an extra set of hands um, and you know, uh, uh, you know, they were always willing to teach for anybody who would take the time to be there. So it, it was an incredible experience. And, and did you find that you had any uh, disrespect because you had a DO degree instead of an MD degree? Yeah, it was incredibly no. Not even I can't remember even one isolated incident or one comment made. In a, n nothing. It was, and I and I was kind of prepared for it. And you know, uh, being That's where I was, five I was, years. I felt like you know I would be strong enough to deal with this. I, my, my, my coworkers, my colleagues there were incredible. Uh, they never made that an issue. They exploited like you know things that I might know do wise that, that weren't part of their programs is to add to the information. Uh, I was never I, I, most of the time I didn't. Even well, I consider commend it. the faculty at uh, at Jefferson for being that open-minded because that isn't always the case. Yeah. Do you know if you, are you the first do? I, I was the first do to go through the program as far as I know, and everybody said. Uh -huh. You know that, that excellent. Congratulations. There hasn't been any other DOs. Thank you. And mm -hmm. it was a, it was an honor. I, and to be honest, it was never even an issue. We never. Well, even talked you know what? It. I get this feeling that you wouldn't have let it be an issue anyway. Yeah. We, we everybody was expected to perform there. You know whether you had DO, to. MD. Um, All right. Yeah. So now, when did you just? You are a sports guy, son. You are a sports guy, and then you went to the dark side. You went to the spine. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. when did that happen? <laughs> You know, uh, <laughs> while I was while I was at Jefferson, and even it might have even started when I was a physical therapist. Oh, don't started, tell me it started that far yeah, back. It, oh my heavens! I, I kind of saw that, that that you know, and I love sports. And the only problem you have with taking care of athletes is slowing them down enough so they don't re-injure themselves as they get back to activity. They're extremely motivated. They're so much fun to to take care of. They're you know they're ex extremely excitable, and uh, the the well, the challenge I saw with the spine was the patients need a little more. TLC, a little more, you know, compassion, Gosh. a little more understanding. Uh -huh. they, you a little more really, understanding of their pain that they have. Yeah, and they had to really understand where things are coming from and why they feel all the things they feel. And they, they, they I, I felt like that extra facet to spine patients was really like challenging to me. And I felt like there was no right one right way to take care yeah, of a still spine get some patient. Sort, sports. There's still yeah. some neck and back when stuff. When did you realize that? Athletes? I'm sorry. No. When did you realize that you had the 3D perception? That because the spine surgeons are a different group than uh, most of us. The trauma surgeons and the spine surgeons need to see in three dimensions without turning it, without the sophisticated computer programs that we have today called 3D whatever. Uh, you, to, to put a screw in those little spots is, <laughs> is pretty special, okay? And the problem with it is you only get one crack at it. So yeah. when did you realize that you had that skill set? 
Yeah, you know, it was probably during during our residency. Where and though? Third year, fourth year? It was year? about Where? second year. Okay. And uh, I was on uh, Dr. Uh, Vaccaro's service at the time, and uh, he's an extremely talented and patient <laughs> man. And uh, he he's will talented and patient. He would go to the end of the world and back if he worked hard. So. You know, being you know hard worker on his service, he had always kind of given me you know a little extra leadway in the OR, and uh, he really gave me a chance to you know be there to to help him operate, to help him perform the procedures, and I got a really great hands-on experience. And when you got to do the other side, yeah, right, right, and and then start. when I started to get to do my side, I realized like you know I kind of understand where things. All right, go. and you knew that after he let you do, everyone gets to do one screw. Right. When, he, when he let you do the second one? Right. <laughs> <laughs> when you're doing the whole side? <laughs> when you're doing the whole side? That's did, he, a, yeah. did he ever, I, I can remember one time as a fourth year student that he came in in a uh, military helmet. <laughs> and he said, it's, it's time to go to war, guys. Right. He, he, he was a character. He I was. Remember. We he called was, it the, every morning on the spine service. Uh, we, you know, we would round 4 o'clock, 4.30, and we would present the patients to him in a room were all the spine doctors and the neurosurgeons present. And uh, he, we would present the patients that came in overnight, whether it be the, you know, the, the fractures, the, the, the people who were going to need surgery, the people who had surgery the day before, how they're doing, what's going on, what do the x-rays look like. And we used to call it the show because it was really the Dr. Vicaro show. He was, uh, what he time kept, did he show up? He would come, well, he, he, would come, he, he was in his office at any time you would call him. And when I would email him in the middle of the night, you know, about a patient thinking he'd get it at first thing in the morning. He would email back five minutes later, you know, and I find out at 2.30 he's either on the treadmill or working or doing something. I'm not sure when he slept, but it probably <laughs> wasn't very much because uh, he never missed an email, even in the middle of the night. Um, and then, you know, when he would come in, he would really turn to, like these things that were really serious things. And, and he was extremely organized and he was extremely, you know, uh, efficient. But he would bring a, you know, a comical side to it and it would make it really enjoyable to, you know, work that hard, to keep up with him, to, to learn from him, you know, and also kind of keep things light enough that nobody's feeling, you know, a ton so of stress and a, pressure. It brings out the best in what you do. you guys going as well. I mean, yeah. uh, when you're and at, I probably have a million hours. stories about him, but, you know, he's, he, he, he's always... How much are you a coffee drinker? Uh, I'm not. Maybe you know, maybe a cup or a half cup a day, just a Is little that, bit. That's it. Were you? How did you stay awake during residency? Pop uh, or? You know, I, occasionally a soda, but really it was fear. I was just I was afraid because uh, when you're at Thomas Jefferson, you would run all night as a resident, especially as a younger resident, and you would run because you didn't have time to walk places. You know, whether it was collecting films or you know evaluating patients, we would get you know 13, 14 new patients a night. They came in, you know, by helicopter from other places with broken necks and backs, and uh, you know, having to get all the films and, and present them properly in the morning, you, you were afraid you would not have enough time to do it, even if you ran all night. So, uh, I think mostly did you lose a lot of weight during the. You, we did, we did, and you never, you know, you always, you never wore like any kind of, you know, OR shoes. It was sneakers. It was running shoes. Like you had something on where you could get to one exactly. place to another quickly, because you spent most of the night doing that, um, and then you know you were in charge of presenting the show to Dr. Fricaro in the morning, but it was, an, it was an exciting experience. Okay, so now we're at, at, the your, end of residence. at the end of five years. Did it get better over the course? Did you have any easy rotations? <laughs> well, you know, over the course of the five years, you, you, know, you, you start to become uh, more s skilled operatively as you get later in your, in your residency and you start to become more of a use in the operating room and, and your, your hours definitely get better. You're still on call, but you're not spending as many nights in the hospital as you were. Uh, and it, it, in terms of getting better, it never really got bad. I always felt really lucky to be where I was. Uh, you know, most, most DOs you know, that, that I, I worked with would, would also feel that same way, that you know, you're in the pinnacle of orthopedics here and you're, you're getting this amazing experience. So even nights where you, know, you, you want to get upset so you, about how much work there is, you still felt pretty lucky to be where you were. But by fifth year, your, your rotations are definitely getting easier. They're focused on more operative skills and developing operative skills. And they're focused more on what you feel like you're going to be going into. I got to do six Tell months everybody, how many surgeries did you perform during? I mean, I, you guys usually have to keep a, my, a record log. My, my final log was a little over 2,000. So it was like 2,100 surgeries by the time I left Jefferson at the end of five years. Pretty good. Which is, yeah, which is kind of, it's, it's about the run of the mill for, for doing what you do. And that's all surgeries included, being sports and spine. 
And, and how did your, your mom and dad handle this? Because they really didn't have an understanding of what medical school was, and they, they, they thought that was bad, and then you got the residency, and your mom probably thought that she wanted to go in and, and, and like, bust her chops or pick it on her baby, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> my mother did. <laughs> my, 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 par my parents grew up, grew up in Russia, and uh, in Russia, the, the greatest job you could possibly have would be to be an engineer. So my dad was an engineer, my sister's an engineer, my brother-in-law's an engineer. And they were like, what is wrong with you? You could have been a great engineer. So the whole time, you know, it was kind of like, you still can't believe you're so good at math, you could have been a great engineer. And it wasn't until I actually started showing my dad x-rays of the screws and rods that he started to say, maybe it's not so bad. You know, maybe it's not so bad to work so hard. And he was joking. They're obviously very proud of me. They were extremely supportive. Uh, whatever I needed during residency with them, they could provide for me, they were right there. You know, and if, I think if either one of them could come in in the middle of the night and, and do what I did, you know, for me. So when do you develop a social life? You're married now. How many kids? Uh, two kids. Right. I have a daughter who's nine. Well, you can't work all the time and have that happen. So when did when did, <laughs> they, when did uh, <laughs> so, Mrs. Zaslavsky come into the uh, picture? Yeah, I, I, th I think it was probably at the end of my residency. We started to have a little more time to develop a, a social life. So that's what I met my wife, Susie. We were both triathletes we we enjoyed like you know competing in different triathlons marathons but you didn't stay in Philadelphia you left for the first time you left the Philadelphia climate and went northwest right, right? yeah and that was uh, shortly after uh, I had met my wife uh, and we were we were dating at the time and she and does she, what she's uh, she's a uh, pharmaceutical representative for Eli Lilly and, and she so, was okay with moving away? Or? Well, she didn't. She, she stayed. stayed because if she left her territory, they'd give it to somebody else, and then she'd come back, and they'd, and they'd give her, One like, a terrible part of town. About, so, yeah. And we decide, I'm going to be working so hard out there, and it's so cold. Why don't you just go by yourself? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but um, from day, from day yeah, one. But what's it like dating a drug rep? <laughs> or a drug, wait, I'm going to start that. A, a drug uh, sales, a drug uh, dealer. A drug dealer. It, yeah. it, it, it's great. It, it, it means that she gets a lot of extra time to make sure that you know, that, great we're gonna, dinners. And we're going to go to a break and come back right after this. Dr. Z, segment three. <laughs> I know they never make me play with these guys, but why do they make me train like them? Training hard is important, and for professional athletes, it's their job. But kids aren't professionals and shouldn't train at that level. Keep kids safe on the playing field and out of the operating room. Become an advocate for sports safety. Visit StopSportsInjuries.org. Welcome back to Youth and Sports. We're here uh, today with Dr. Z, uh, new member of First State Orthopedics as of February of 2013. And we've been talking about uh, his upbringing through uh, medical school, his career prior to that with physical therapy, into his residency. And I want to know about his fellowship. Uh, in orthopedics, a lot of guys go from doing their residency into an extra year or even occasionally two years. And Dr. <laughs> Z has done a fellowship in uh, spine Tell us about it. Uh, so my fellowship was out in Minneapolis at the Twin City Spine Center. It was uh, uh, 13 spine surgeons. They do more spine surgery there than anywhere else in the country. And uh, it was incredible. You got to rotate with each of the spine surgeons uh, while I was out there and Can spend time learning their techniques. Can you tell us quickly, because I don't think a lot of people out there know, how is it trying to get a fellowship like that? It's pretty competitive. So there, there's... Um, 
you know, it, 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 there's a group of uh, people who are out looking for fellowships in spine surgery, and it's, that's, your, that's your pool of applicants. And there's a very limited amount of approved fellowships across the country that these people are looking at. And it's a match system. So you basically say, hey, I was at these places, and I really love A, B, C, D, and E in this order. And you hope that they also liked you in a similar order. And, and then they, they kind of match you up to the fellowship that you choose. So it's, it's very competitive. And, and while you're out there and you meet the other applicants, you think, there's no way I'm going to wind it's, up anywhere, you know, because everybody's so talented and everybody's so well qualified for the, for the spots. And there you are. You're, you have that. What did you learn there that, that, what, that you didn't learn at Jefferson? What was your takeaway time? Yeah, what was nice there is that uh, there was 13 spine surgeons, and we spent time with all of them. So you get bits and pieces from everybody. You know, so you feel you're a hybrid right now? Right. And, and we do things you know, on the East Coast a little different than they do it in the Midwest. Um, they have a, a, you know, a much different outlook on certain different types of uh, procedures. They, they kind of bring in newer procedures a little quicker than we might see them on the East Coast. And uh, they, they kind of have a, a different mentality as to taking care of the patients. So it was, it was a great mix with Jefferson. Characterize uh, yourself right now. You're, now. you're coming with us. You're uh, going to be added to Dr. Katz and Dr. Rudin on our spine service. And uh, what kind of patients are you going to be looking for when you're here? You know you're going to do bread and butter, cervical disc, lumbar disc. You're going to do the trauma associated with that. But what, uh, what tickles your fancy? Someone that's so used to working with instrumentation, and if you've ever seen the spine instruments, it's like a drop your jaw. <laughs> what is it, right. uh, what is it that, that you like doing? What's your favorite operation? Uh, you know, I, I really love minimally invasive surgery, and I think when, when done on the right patient at the right time, it could be yeah, a really... Yeah, but the small incision doesn't mean you didn't do a lot of work. That's absolutely right. Yeah, a lot of work happens under, under that incision. You have to prepare patients for it because they also feel pain after, after that incision just after, the same as they would it with a larger incision. So what's, which area of the body do you like to... I love the cervical spine. So I love the neck. You're a neck guy. I'm a neck guy. Uh, I just feel like it's a, it's a very delicate operation. Uh, and it's a very rewarding operation done properly, and I feel like patients uh, do really well with the right types of surgery, and they get they get excellent results. Wow! So you have you're a neck guy. Uh, is there any particular area of the spine that you're not going to deal with? No, I, I think I'm very comfortable with all the areas of the spine. We got uh, how about the the 25 year old that has the kyphotic deformity or the scoliotic deformity that's no longer where from AI Dupont. And right. they, they kind of say, you know, after 19, sayonara. Right. Well, those kids have to go somewhere. Uh, is that something that you've had a fair amount of experience with and you're comfortable with? Yeah, with, with my training in Minneapolis, we took care of a lot of adult deformity patients who come in with large curves, you know, and, and need a much different operation than a child who has a flexible curve. So I, I am very comfortable with adult deformity as well. Uh, you know, and I enjoy working with athletes. I enjoy working with, you know, injured workers. I think there's, a, you know, the, the reward for me is to see a patient through their injury, through their spinal injury, and get them back to what they used to do before. Are you comfortable it, with the legal process? And many of these po folks are associated with car accidents and so forth, and you have legal obligations to do reports and so forth. Have you had experience in that area? Uh, and that's what I'm starting to acquire now, and that was my main reason for, for coming to work. Where I'm, where I'm going. I feel like the group that I'm joining, the, Dr. Root and Dr. Katz, are, are fantastic mentors in so many aspects of science, spine surgery. I've had the chance to spend a couple days with both of them and to kind of get to know their practices and their talents, and I'm extremely impressed with not only their surgical talents, but also their ability to kind of have a multifaceted practice that deals with all the different types of patients. I, I want to know also, being new to the hospital system, you're also going to be taking care of trauma, I guess, correct? Absolutely. So you'll be doing other stuff uh, from, you know, tibial plateau fracture. Do you do all that stuff as oh, well? Oh, sure. Yeah, anything that would come in on a trauma service that would need emergent surgery, you know, something. Well, that we, at swear. first date, we fortunately have Dr. Brady and Dr. Johnson who are traumatologists, uh -huh. and really what they would like you to do is just stabilize it and keep it for them until <laughs> right? the next morning, which is the right. same thing they're going to do for those spine injuries for you. I assure you that... <laughs> Right. I think Christianic care. I'm going to share. compliment. Share. I'm going to compliment Christianic care, and I'm going to compliment First Day Orthopedics on selecting guys that are talented in the areas for which they're talented, and recognizing that they have partners who have world expertise in what they do, 
And that's another thing. I know you're coming uh, to us now uh, with an understanding that the guys in our group uh, have hopefully know their limitations and will choose to, to consult you on the things that you're good at. Sure. And, and that's why we do fellowships, and that's why we have a multi-specialty group. And that's what I'm looking forward to. I'd love to do more of what I'm most comfortable with, you know, which is taking Spons. care of spinal injury patients. You know, and, and, I'm, and I'm obviously happy to you know, help the other guys with. How did you, uh, my first uh, encounter with spine, believe it or not, was a trampoline accident in which a 16-year-old became a quadriplegic. How did you, you know these things are beyond your control. Yeah. How did you train your, your, the emotional part of that particular injury to be able to handle that? Because to me, I walked away from that. I thought that I just wanted to, I'm sorry you can't play again, I'll do my best. But at the third time you tear your ACL, it probably isn't in your best interest to play football. But right. you don't get that luxury. Right. It's, uh, that's one of the most difficult parts of spine. And at, at Thomas Jefferson at Rothman Institute, we used to see somebody you know, who's young, who was paralyzed almost every night. And that's uh, probably the most dis difficult discussion you'll have to have with parents. And it takes a while for it to set in with the patient and the family that it's not probable you're going to walk again. Um, but as they start to accept that and you start to help them through the rehabilitation process, you kind of start to teach them, like, look, you're going to have other options in life. You know, doing something that requires you to walk is probably not going to be one of them, but you're not going to be limited in who you can be and what you're going to do. Do you think your therapy background, having dealt with that, those steps associated with it, prepared you better for that understanding? Yeah, I think that's what's given me my appreciation for spine. Mm. You know, that it kinda, I kind of know the steps, and I've kind of seen the patients later in their rehab. And I know that, you know, even though you're not going to be able to do things the way you used to, you're going to be able to do things, and we're going to teach you how. And so kind of having a little foreshadowing in my mind about these patients helps me kind of encourage them right off the bat. You know, that we're going to get so you through you're, this. You're able to make some kind of uh, effort to progress these people further in what they're going to be doing even without being able to walk or use their arms. Yeah, you've kind of seen Which, the light at the end of the tunnel. Of therapy, you know, I mean, you see that, that These therapy. people, can, you, you can live a very productive life. You Before know? we convince everyone that's the viewing audience that you can cure absolutely everything all the time. <laughs> no, no, and there's a lot of there's folks lot of out there that, that have had not. three and four operations. Sure. One of the things that I have been, and I have never met someone more talented than Dr. Rudin, and, and hopefully Dr. Zaz will convince me that I've never met more, someone more talented than he. Uh, but there are people that you just can't make better. Yeah. Have, have you, it's, as a young surgeon, I had trouble figuring who those people were initially. Okay? It's, it's, but you're not going to be able to make everyone better. Right. And uh, I, I think that's kind of one of the challenges that you face now. And I'm because the technology is so good and you're thinking they have a cure for this and, and gosh. It's yeah. And sometimes you feel like I can fix the x-ray, but you have to kind of remind yourself, can you can you help this patient? Can you get this person more functional? And, Can you make them feel better? Just, you know, or is it just going to be fixing the X-ray? And, and that and, and that's, you have a, that's a great with point. Folks that have had, you know, their their bodies have been in pain for so long Year, yeah, that they're yeah. taking such large things of medication, even though they don't want to take them. It's the only way they can get, get through the day. Right. You know, it's a, yeah, a I mean, hard you thing. deal with a lot of that. You deal with a lot of chronic neck and back pain. Absolutely. And, and you know, and, and you have to have that reason. discussion at times where, you know, it, the surgery could fix the MRI and we could, you know, make things look better, but it won't necessarily give you back any quality to your life. And it might not, it might just set you back in the meantime. So I, I think, it, like you said, Dr. Axe, knowing your limitations is extremely well, important. Well, you'd have to determine those with time. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes they punch you in the nose. Sometimes you learn your limitations because you see your limitations. Right. It's like <laughs> it this is the problem that doesn't have a solution to right. right now. When you have a complicated spine problem, who do you call? You know, I, I, I usually call a couple different people, but I, I usually, you know, will text or email Dr. Picaro, uh -huh. see what he thinks, see I if would he agrees. have bet from the, the people that you've established early yeah. uh, in your career, are the people you're the most comfortable with. Sure. I'm sure he's as proud of you as your parents are. Because yeah, he's, he's a huge supporter. Because your parents are just Great. beginning to understand your talent. I, I really believe it. <laughs> Speaking firsthand with my parents, it took them a uh, while. My, my dad thought someone else took my exams for me uh, along the way. And they and, did. And they, you know, I wish they'd have done better. 
<laughs> if you're going to take my test for me, you at least can get me a higher <laughs> a grade. Higher. Listen, in summation, Dr. Zaflaski is going to be joining us. He's a spine surgeon. He'll be joining First Day Orthopedics in February of 2013. His area of expertise is the spine. His area of interest are, are the neck. He'll be taking care of predominantly spine cases in our office. He will have uh, emergency room responsibilities uh, as part of everyone who joins the staff at Christiana Care and Orthopedics is asked to do uh, general trauma uh, during the course of their first eight years or so. Uh, <laughs> that's part of the whole deal, but hopefully we'll get him off of that earlier. Uh, he is taking on the, as complex a case as you can get. Uh, he'll be working with Dr. Katz and Dr. Rudin at the Spine Center on Harmony Road and somewhat at our main office at the Medical Arts Pavilion. He'll be taking appointments uh, anytime after mid-January. He'll be joining us in, in February. So for those people that would like to see him, if you haven't been impressed with uh, hearing his story and appreciating his enthusiasm, you probably should go to a different group than First Aid Orthopedics because I'm sure impressed. And most of you know me out there know that that isn't an easy uh, undertaking. I've been impressed with the young man on my right. Uh, Dr. Joe Strait with his, his enthusiasm and his desire to make a difference in the community. And I look forward to Dr. Z joining our team with that same attitude. I look forward as well. Okay. So, Thank you. Dr. Z, First Aid Orthopedics, February 2013. What does opportunity mean to you? At Wilmington University, it means finding your relevance in the job market. That's why we offer career-oriented degree programs that meet employment needs in emerging fields. Dedicated professors bring their real-world experience into the classroom so you'll graduate with the tools you need to succeed on the job. It's your degree. Make it relevant to your career. Personalized education, affordable tuition, that's the difference at Wilmington University. This show was sponsored by ATI, the company taking physical therapy to a higher level throughout the country. First State Orthopedics, where youth and sports hosts Dr. Strait and Axe are members of the team taking care of Delaware with a commitment to excellence. And President Jack Barcelona and his Wilmington University College of Technology, where each semester this student-run program is produced, directed, edited, and distributed under the guidance of the TV production faculty. Each guest receives a copy of the show, and all shows are available on the web at youthandsports.com.